and recognizing that one may be prospering. And you know, too often times, as long as we're doing all right, we ain't too worried about what's going on with somebody else. But I, I think it's important that we remember there's a bunch of people that are having issues right now. And it's important that we make sure from a leadership standpoint that we're paying attention to that. Amen? Amen. And I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. And I know that during this time of pandemic, we've tried to do our part as a church to try to help those who are in need, who are members of our church, and uh, some members in the community as well. And I just want to say God is good. And all the time, amen. I want to turn your attention to the book of John chapter 14. Two weeks ago, I got started on this passage, and I mentioned to you that I would come back because there was no way for me to finish this uh, text because uh, of so much being in it. Last week, I turned attention to the Martin Luther King holiday and the importance of uh, we try to be relevant, amen, not just go on anyway, you know, but to realize that it was an important day as we celebrate Dr. King's birthday. But I wanted to come back to this passage in John chapter 14 as we see that God's word in John 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 are so important for us today. So this is part two to the divine if. Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, Lord Jesus, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. Or in King James, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. He reminds us that I will come to you and that he who has been left with you is being left to stay with you no matter what. Amen. Oh, God, we come in the name of Jesus, even in the midst of what we're dealing with today, and we just want to thank you for a spirit of going on anyhow. We thank you, Father, for this wonderful group of people gathered here in the sanctuary and those that are listening on the radio and those that are listening on the conference line. We thank you. Father, we thank you. I'm going to say it again. Father, we thank you. We thank you. And we praise you. And thank you for putting in us the importance of not allowing obstacles to get in our way. That when they do, our job is to remember that even when we come to the end of our rope, that we're to tie a knot and hang on. And here we are, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Whatever the devil meant for evil, you meant for good. And I pray to thank you for what you have done and how you've done it. And pray that we have a wonderful time in this service today. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God a big hand of praise. You may be seated. The book of John is written by one of Jesus' favorites. Y'all didn't hear me. I'm going to try this again. Jesus' favorite. In every family, somebody just knows that they're the favorite. You, you understand, right? Some of you here are the favorite. Some of us are uh, what they call the black sheep of the family. You understand. So, so, sometimes that's the case, but... But favorites are special. You, you understand. When we have children and grandchildren, I've always said to people, it's important to treat all of them the same. But even in your heart, you know, there's just one that's got, you, you, you understand, that there's always, <laughs> see, 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 amen. Let, let, me, let, me, let me quit meddling because some of you were the favorite. That's why you're so spoiled that we can't do nothing with you now. <laughs> 
But John, if you notice, if you ever see any of the um, paintings about the Lord's Supper, and when they're in the upper room, you'll notice that there's one who's sitting next to him with his head on his shoulder. That's considered John, because John was that special uh, to Jesus. As a matter of fact, only in John do you see the, the various connections that are made personally by Jesus and John because of the relationship they have. And he loves them. And in fact, if you think about it, he's the one that Jesus asked to take care of mom when he left. Somebody hear me here. So, right? He, he, said, he said as he's dying, he wanted uh, the world to know, uh, mother, here is your son. Son, here is your mother. Do I have a witness here today? In this, in other words, there was something that about John that was special. He didn't ask any of the other disciples. You understand. He asked John, and, and, and I think about that from a standpoint of you don't just leave the comfort and the importance of your mother's health and strength just in anybody's hands. Uh, I'm, I'm try this again. Y'all, y'all didn't, y'all didn't catch that, but. Mama needs to be left in good hands. Mama needs to be left in hands that are similar to yours. Amen? And you know, you've got some people around you, friends and family and all that stuff, and some of them just aren't as mature. I'm going to get off this in just a second, but I'm trying to lay the groundwork for why this is important. You see, some of us may be... Uh, well into maturity. What do you mean, preacher? Some in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but still act like they're 12. Uh, a a amen. A and you're not going to leave mama in the hands of that one. A amen. And at the same time, you've got some 20-year-olds, by the way, that are just an old soul. That if I <clears throat> that if I ask for a show of hands, some of us around here been old for a long time. A a amen. And, and, that, and, and by the way, we didn't ask for it. It's just one of those things that happened that, that we believed that we had to be more responsible and deal with things in a certain way, not the way the other 20-year-olds would deal with them. Amen? Because John was not an old man when Jesus died. John was a young man, but it's pretty clear that he had distinguished himself uh, with Jesus Christ. Uh, as the, he brings the, the, the disciples together, we have to remember that among them were those that were mature and immature. There were those that believed and didn't believe. And if you have trouble with that, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 28. And uh, oftentimes we read about the, the command, the great commission in verse number 18, but see, you need to go up to 16 and 17 and see that, by the way, they were called to meet him, but the Bible says some still, y'all don't hear me, some still doubted. And, and you see, they had seen him do all kinds of things, but the fact is they had seen miracles, they had seen all kinds of things, but yet some still doubted. And that's exactly where we find ourselves today, where we've got people who call themselves Christians, and yet we still doubt what it is that God can do. Now, by the way, there ain't no reason for anybody to think I'm just talking to you, because i got to deal with this issue myself, because there are times, and there are times when I use myself as an example, because you all are too cute, and I know very well that you have not done these things, so I have to use myself sometimes as an example, because you see, I know that there have been times when I've doubted whether God could deal with the issue that I'm going through. You understand? Because it feels overwhelming to me, and I know that there's no way that he's going to deal with this, and he hasn't dealt with it already. So the fact of the matter is, I don't know whether he can deal with it, but I come to tell you that I'm so glad that I have come to a place of spiritual maturity to understand that no matter how difficult the situation is, I know that God can handle it. Amen? No matter how I may, my humanness, in my, in, my, in, in my flesh, I might think differently or I might wonder 
for a few moments whether that's the case, but as I said to someone when I was counseling with them recently, I told him, I said, it's not what you feel initially, it's what you know eventually. Do I have a witness here? Because sometimes we're going to feel that way, and yet ultimately it's important that we end up in the right spot. You understand. Well, what do you mean, preacher? You see, first of all, it is important that everybody understand that mature or not mature, Jesus was leaving the church to the disciples. Come on, somebody. He, he, knew, he knew who they were. He knew what their, their failings were. He knew what their, their good things were. He knew everything about them. But the fact of the matter is he chose them. He nurtured them. He taught them. He scolded them. And he left with an understanding that they would be the foundation of the church. No, let me just tell you, we're sitting in the midst of this conversation that he's having with them, and he's telling them something, and this is why I said the divine if. Because you see, if is a very important and conditional word. I mentioned to you two weeks ago that it may be a short word, but it makes all the difference in the world. Jesus said, uh, if you love me, Somebody doesn't hear me, so I, I, I need to repeat that. If you love me, in other words, he's saying, I'm not taking it for granted because I've seen how you act. I'm not taking it for granted because I've seen your doubt. I'm not taking you for granted because I recognize that sometimes your faith is about as strong as the, the hill you just got over, that all you need is to go through another bad situation, and there's a question as to how strong your faith is going to be. Do I have a witness here? And what we realize is that Jesus understands how transactional sometimes our faith can be. Do I have a witness here? Maybe not your faith, but you understand some of us have problems every now and then. We're mighty happy after we get through, but all we need to have is another problem come. And then, by the way, it happened in biblical history. The same guy, Elijah, that tested the people of Baal, he told them, to go on and show the power of their God. Show the power of their God. Bring fire down, as a matter of fact. And they could not get, uh, the, 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 if you know the story, the story will tell you that they, they, they called out to Baal. They called loud to Baal. And as a matter of fact, nothing happened. You see, Baal was a fake God in the first place. But stay with me about the story. You see, uh, Elijah told them, keep on calling him. As a matter of fact, maybe he doesn't hear you. Call a little bit louder. Y'all don't hear me. That, that's the story. I'm not making that up. That's not Hennessy yeah. chapter 3, verse 4. That's the, that's the text. The text tells us that he challenged them, and indeed, they were killing themselves, sweating, trying to get Baal to show up and show Baal's power. But when it came time for him to show the power of his God, he not only put wood together, he poured water. Somebody doesn't hear me. He poured water over the wood because he wanted them to know the power of his God that even if the kindling isn't dry and it's fully wet, he can still bring down fire. As a matter of fact, when you read the rest of the text, what you find out is that immediately God showed up in the fire. And that's a good thing. And that's at the top of a hill. But by the way, not very long afterward, there was a woman called Jezebel. Somebody, somebody didn't hear me. This same one that was on top of the mountain showing everybody how strong his God was. But he heard that Jezebel was looking for him. And he knew what kind of woman Jezebel was and knew how evil she was. And somehow, rather than standing flat-footed and say, bring on Jezebel, he ran to a cave to get out of the way of Jezebel. And many times, that is exactly the example that we show. That's the example the disciples show. Because when Jesus uh, got in got in trouble. I put that in quote marks for those that aren't in here. I want you to know that all of them skied up. That, that's what we said when I was growing up. I'm sorry. I, let, let, let me bring you fast forward 30 years. Amen. Y'all don't use terminology like that. But they all got ghosts. Amen. And the fact of the matter is, 
<laughs> I know y'all don't expect this from me, but the fact, <laughs> fact of the matter is, it is clear that Jesus understood who they were. And the fact that he knew who they were, knew what their character was, knew how they were able or not able, knew how mature or not mature they were, he still loved them. And the reason why I say that is because earlier he told them that I want you to love one another as I have loved you. No, by the way, when he says, as I have loved you, and you and I know that there's some folk around here that are hard to love. You might as well go on and tell the truth about it. There's some folks that are hard, 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 I, uh, hard to love. Some of them in your family, you understand, hard to love. But you got to love them anyhow. I don't care. You still got to love them anyhow because he said, as I have loved you. And in other words, substitute you and me for the disciples and realize sometimes we ain't all that easy to love either. A amen belongs right there. And the fact is, what he does is he says to them, if you love me, by the way, in other words, he's saying, I've already proven I love you. I don't have to prove that anymore. I don't need to prove to you that I love you because I've hung in here with you. I've stood by you. I've hung in when you've been with me and not with me, when I've needed you or not needed you. I have been right here next to you. And by the way, more than that, I chose you. And the fact is, all of those things are clear. But he said, if you love me, then I expect you to keep my commands. What do you mean, preacher? Well, indeed, what he said is that I've taught you already to love your neighbor. I've taught you to love your neighbor as yourself. I've taught you to love your God. I've taught you to do the things that I've called you to do. Don't just do the words, do the work. I'm going to try that one more time. Somebody didn't hear it. Don't just do the words, do the work. He said, so I love you so much that I'm making sure that when I get ready to go that I'm leaving something with you so that you will be as strong without me as you are with me. And the difference is that you may not be able to see who it is that I'm leaving, but you'll be able to feel who it is that I'm leaving. Do I have a witness here? I came to tell you that he said, I'm leaving you an advocate. I'm leaving you the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, in the Old Testament, he would bring the Spirit on people and take it away. He said, but this Spirit is going to be with you forever. So in other words, when you get weak, you need to remember that when you say you're weak, you're depending on yourself. I've given you the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit only knows how to be strong. The Holy Spirit only knows how to do well. The Holy Spirit only knows how to comfort. The Holy Spirit only knows how to bring to remembrance everything that you have been taught. The Holy Spirit knows how to lift you up when you are down. The Holy Spirit knows how to give you strength that you didn't think you had. The Holy Spirit is able to walk with you through anything. And even if you're by yourself, the Holy Spirit will be with you. That's the power. That's the power that I'm leaving with you. I'm leaving you with the strongest power ever. He said, not only am I leaving this help with you, this help will be with you forever. And I came to tell you that one of the things that causes me to be so happy is it says the world cannot accept him. The world can't accept the power of the Holy Spirit. The world can't accept the power of the Holy Spirit, you see, because the world hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Do I have a witness here? Because you see, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, he gives you a wonderful understanding that you don't just have him. You've got the Father, you've got the Son, and you've got the Holy Spirit. In worldly terms, they call that a trifecta. Ain't nothing stronger than that. It's nice to know that you've got him on your side. But you see, the world has a problem. The world is from Missouri. You see, it's got to be shown. Do, do I have a witness here? There, there is indeed a statement that's made that you can tell somebody there are three billion stars in the universe and they'll believe you, but if you, they see a sign on a bench that says wet paint, they've got to touch it to be sure. 
the fact of the matter is we need to remember that Jesus is talking to his disciples and by extension he's talking to us and he's saying the world can't handle this. The world can't handle this and as a matter of fact you're going to run into situations where the world is not going to like what you're doing because the world doesn't understand who you are. This past week people didn't understand your pastor when I stood in the Muslim Educational Trust and forgave a man who was contrite about the things that he had said that were disparaging about black people, about Muslim people, and all of that kind of stuff. He came as a contrite man. I come to you to tell you that the one thing I know that my brothers and sisters need to get an understanding that if you want to be that mean-spirited and keep that person in a box, that is not utilizing the power of the Holy Spirit. What we've got to do as children of God is to recognize my responsibility is to live like God wants me to, to accept and to forgive like God wants me to. That person has got an issue they've got to deal with with God, and that is not my problem. My problem is to show up when somebody says that I as a pastor is in the house and I'm there to represent the church of God. I come in that house recognizing no matter how I may feel that I've got to show up for God. You've got to show up for God and recognize that you need to do it. We need to do it God's way. And that means there are going to be some people that don't necessarily like what we do. But as long as you know that you have talked to God about it, it doesn't matter. I'm not worried about anything when it comes to that. When you talk to God about it, when he leads you to do what you need to do, you need to go on and get it done and quit giving more opportunity for the world than for his word. In other words, when we are not willing, we are acting like Elijah when it came to Jezebel. Come on now. We're giving the world way more credit than they deserve. That what we need to do is stand up to the world and tell them, that's right, that's the extent of love I'm supposed to have. That's the extent of love and forgiveness I'm supposed to have. And by the way, I've messed up in my life before too, and I'm grateful that God forgave me. I'm grateful that people forgave me. I'm grateful, and as a result of that, I came to tell you, it wasn't just one time. God has blessed us and forgiven us time after time after time. And yep, I want you to know right in that very room, over in that Muslim Educational Trust, I brought down the word of God and told them that you know what in my tradition there are some disciples that ask the question how often do we have to forgive and Jesus said as they said seven times he said 70 times seven so my feeling is the world need to understand where this comes from it's not because I'm so good it's because the word of God is so strong and the word of God is strong enough to lead, guide, and direct. Oh no, the world ain't gonna like it. The world ain't gonna like it because the world can't see him. But see, I'm so glad that I'm not depending and you aren't depending on the world. Aren't you glad that as a result of Jesus Christ, he changed everything? The Bible, te- the world tells me, the, 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 the word tells me, scholars tell me, that he's so bad that he changed time. That when he came on the scene, that before he came on the scene, I don't know what they called it, but after he came on the scene, they called it B.C. and A.D. Come on now. That's just how bad our God is. He's so bad that one plus one plus one in the world means three. But in the body of Christ, one plus one plus one still equals one. I came to tell you that's just how bad our God is. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Have you been there before where the doctor scratched their heads and said, no way, this person is going to live, and here they still are after all these years still here? That's God doing that stuff. Don't get it twisted. That's God doing that stuff. Knowing that you applied for a job that others don't think you're qualified for, but you got the job anyhow, I came to tell you, that's God. In your family where things are messed up and all of a sudden things come together, that's God. Can I tell you? Lord Jesus, can I go up and down the list of showing you how God shows up? He shows up through the power of the Holy Spirit. How is it that you can praise him on a day that you don't know where the next meal is coming from? But you learned how to praise him because praising him means that he's going to take care of everything. I'm just about done. I like this part where he says, but you know him. <laughs> uh, do, do you know him? I got anybody here that knows who the Holy Spirit is, know what the Holy Spirit does. That's why sometimes when we're singing, we start moving. That's why sometimes when folks are singing, they start dancing. That's the reason why some folks, when we're singing, they start clapping. Because you see, once the Holy Spirit is in you, you can't direct the Holy Spirit as to how you're supposed to act. But one thing I know, that if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, what it will do is move from your toes to the top of your head. And it's going to make you move sometimes. It's going to strengthen you sometimes. It's going to remind you sometimes how far God has brought us. Do I have a witness here? He has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has brought us from doubt to faith. He has brought us from desolation to hope. He has brought us from sadness to happiness. He has brought us knowing that everything is going to be all right. The world doesn't understand it. And the world doesn't have to understand it. Because the, tr the truth is, it says, he lives in you, and he'll be in you. What does that mean, preacher? I'm just about done. I'm getting ready to round third and head for home. Anytime you have had an x-ray or an MRI, I dare you to ask him, could you find the Holy Spirit in there? <laughs> All right, preacher. Yes, yes, yes. See, see, what I know is the MRI may be a great machine, it can find out all kinds of things. An x-ray is a great machine. It can find out all kinds of things. But the one thing I know is that they can't figure out where in here is the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, I don't know where it is myself, but I do know that it's in there, and I do know that it makes a difference, and I do know that it's all right, and I do know that it's not going anywhere, and I do know that I can depend on it. I do know that I've got hope. I do know that he'll be there, and he'll always be there for us. It says the Holy Spirit will be with you and will be in you. And then finally he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you, meaning that the Holy Spirit gives you strength. The Holy Spirit brings to remembrance. But don't you forget that the three of us are working together. We don't argue with each other. Who are the three you're talking about? I'm talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I want you to know that the Holy Spirit uh, is working through the storm uh, with you. Uh, and while you're going through the storm, uh, the Son is talking to the Father. Said, I know this storm looks bad. Uh, I know that he or she deserves uh, to have it all over. But, Lord, I'm asking you, uh, will you give them one more chance? Uh, Will you give them one more opportunity? You see, there's no argument uh, between the three of them. There's no jury uh, between the three of them. They are judge uh, and jury all by themselves. Uh, finally, I want you to know uh, that the good news uh, about being a child of God uh, is that you are in uh, an unfair fight. What does that mean, preacher? 
Well, if you don't get anything else, uh, make sure you get this. You're in an unfair fight with the world. You see, the world wants to destroy us. The world wants us to shut up. Uh, you're in an unfair fight uh, because, see, the battle and the victory was won a long time ago on Calvary. So no matter what, you are victorious. No matter what you're going through, you are victorious. You don't need to be facing the fight worried about whether you're going to win or not. The battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. It's an unfair fight, uh, but I'm so glad uh, that God is unfair when it comes uh, to the fight between you and the world. He's going to walk with you. He's going to talk with you. He's going to stand with you. He's going to encourage you to keep on going. Do I have a witness here? That's what Calvary was all about. That's what the grave was all about. That's what the third day morning was all about. That's what the next 40 days or 50 days was all about. That's what happened. That's what it's all about. When he went back to his father, he said, I'm going to advocate for you. We're in an unfair fight, uh, and I don't know about you, but I'm mighty glad uh, to be in a fixed fight knowing that God has already got the fix in, uh, that it's going to be all right, uh, that you're going to win. Do I have a witness here? So quit walking around like you done lost. Quit walking around like you're sucking on lemons. Walk around victorious. Walk around knowing that I'm a child of God, and he's going to take care of all of this. Let's stand and give God a big praise. Mm. Do I have a witness? Do I have a witness? <laughs>